Today's speaker is Sayaksan Gupta from Binghamton. Please, you're on. Um, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. And I would also like to thank Professor Nathan sir for inviting me. Um, I work with uh, Professor Alexander Borisov in Binghamton University. And uh, uh, to my belief, uh, Professor Nathanson has some experience working with him before, and he sends his regards. Um, OK, so um, the, the idea is uh, we want to define a few polynomials first. This is the setup uh, for this P, calligraphic P would be our set of all primes in C. And uh, by a subset A of P, I, uh, I will basically mean a finite subset. And for any integer A in Z, we can always define things like this. So uh, P of A is going to be just all the primes which are absent in A. And uh, P subscript capital A of small a is going to be all the primes which are absent in A and divides A. And finally, when we want uh, the finite subset A to be empty, I will just write PA instead of P phi of A. Okay, so now uh, we will write the polynomials as U. So U is going to be a polynomial over Z in one variable. And I would also like to uh, consider exactly those polynomials which have degree greater than or equals to one. So I'm not considering uh, constant polynomials. And for the iterations, when I say u to the n, so like this, u to the n of x, I will mean uh, u composed with itself n times. All right, so now we can start defining things. So firstly, when I say a polynomial u is weakly locally nilpotent out at r. So you, you have a starting point r, and we are constructing this dynamical sequence u of r, u of u of r, and so on. Uh, so uh, I will say that a polynomial u is going to be weakly locally nilpotent at r outside some set A. Uh, by that, I will mean that all the prime numbers which are absent in A is going to give you a uh, zero modulo p. So there is going to be some iteration of u at r such that that particular iteration modulo p is going to be equals to zero. And this has to happen for every prime p, which is not in A. Okay. And if this A happens to be an empty set, then we will say, instead of saying weakly locally important, we will just say locally important. And we are not going to uh, talk about A because it is well, uh, empty. And these are some of the notations that we will use. So L R A D, that is going to be all the locally nil, weakly locally nilpotent polynomials at R, which are outside A and of degree D. So this power we will mean the degree. This R will uh, mean the starting point, and this A will mean the primes that we are ignoring. And similarly, when uh, we don't write D, that would mean we are taking the union of all of these guys where D runs from one to infinity. And then, uh, so in, in here, you, you see we are considering Z zero at the level of primes, but now uh, there is also a concept where we can say that it is actually equals to zero for some iteration and, and a given starting point. So at that, those kind of polynomials we will call nilpotent polynomials at R. And uh, the first time that uh, this iteration sees zero, we are going to call that iteration the index of nilpotency or nilpotency index of u at r. And again, a few notations here. N R I D, that would mean uh, nilpotent at r of index i and of degree d. And R I would mean these guys, but we are taking union over all the possible d's. And in R would mean we are taking union over all the possible I's and all the possible T's. So in other words, in R is going to be the set of all nilpotent polynomials at R of some degree of some index. Uh, and the 
this is something we will uh, talk about in a moment. So that uh, so one thing is clear: if you hit zero at certain point in the orbit, then of course modulo every prime, you are going to get zero. You, you target that particular index, right? Uh, so it is clear that if a polynomial is nilpotent, it is definitely locally nilpotent. So you you, you have this. Uh, Containment that is clear, but a question uh, arises at this point: is is the other direction also true? Is uh, uh, or are all locally nilpotent polynomials at R going to be nilpotent? So that is actually wrong, and that is wrong for every R. Not even a single exception is there. For every R, we are going to have a locally nilpotent polynomial, which is not nilpotent. So that is why. We, we uh, have used these notations. SRD is going to be the set of all locally nilpotent polynomials at R of degree D, which are non nilpotent. And SR is going to be the union of all of these guys. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this is something for more uh, for convenience uh, rather than like to save some space, is that whenever you have ABC, uh, integers with c not equals to zero, whenever I want to say that a is congruent to b modulo c, I will write it as this. Okay. So I'm defining things over z here, but uh, it, it's, it's not hard to see that all of these definitions can be generalized to a number field, arbitrary number field. So what Changes uh, would we like to make? So, uh, by the way, when I say number field, I will, I will mean a global number field, which is a finite extension of Q. So, of course, Z is going to be replaced by OK. It's a ring of integers. And uh, the, the primes that we are dealing with is going to be replaced by all the maximal ideals. So, that's all non zero prime ideals, basically. It's a dedicated domain. So, we have that. And the rest is uh, straightforward. What, what, uh, what changes we need to make that is kind of clear for the definitions I mean. All right, so next I would like to look at some examples. So firstly, one notices that if your starting point is R, then if you're looking at nilpotent polynomials of index one, then that means that R is a root, literally a root. So for every R, you can construct this polynomial where Q is a non-zero polynomial. It, it can even be a constant, doesn't matter. So that, that, that would mean that uh, it is a nilpotent polynomial of index one at R. Okay. Uh, so this is of index one. Let's look at something of index two. So we can uh, look at this particular polynomial and your starting point can be minus one. So if you do that, you will see that u of minus one is equals to minus two and u of minus two is equals to zero. So that means it is nilpotent at minus one of index two. In fact, uh, I, uh, I should have written it here, but in fact, it's not uh, very hard to see that you can make a small change to this and still start with the same starting point. Uh, when I say same, I don't mean minus one, I mean one. Just to give you an example that you do have nilpotent polynomials of index two and uh, starting point one. So instead of writing minus two X plus, uh, minus two X minus four, you can write minus two X plus four. And then you can check that U of one is going to be two and U, U of two is going to go to zero. So that polynomial minus two X plus four is going to be nilpotent at one of index two. So you can in, in fact construct families of this. So you can uh, take any R, which is uh, different from minus one, and then you can construct a family like this, U R of X, where you define U R of, U R of X to be equals to minus R plus one times X, and then plus R plus one squared. So one reason that I'm ignoring the minus one is because uh, if you do that, you, you end up with a constant. So I, want, I don't want to do that. So that is why I excluded minus one. And then uh, it's very easy to check that U of R of R plus one is going to be 
uh, sorry, uh, u r of r is going to be r plus one. And then uh, the, the next time, uh, the next one is going to be equals to zero. So u of r plus one is going to be equals to zero because obviously uh, one of the root in there is r plus one. And similarly, you can construct another family where r is different from zero. Uh, and uh, yeah, so minus two x plus four r. And if you plug in, if you start from r, you can get two r. And when you plug in two r, you get zero. So that there are plenty of examples to talk about of when it comes to nilpotent polynomials. Okay, and uh, so next example is where I tell you that. So uh, recall, if I go back to the first page, I said that there exists local nilpotent polynomials which are not nilpotent, and that exists for every R. So this, uh, the example C that we see here is going to give you one example like that when your starting point is one. So let's say your polynomial U of X is this polynomial X plus one, it's a linear polynomial. And uh, by induction, it's very easy to see that U N of one is going to be N plus one. So if your starting point is one, then of course you cannot ever have zero in the orbit. Okay, but for every prime p, the p minus one iteration of u at one is going to be exactly equals to p, which is obviously congruent to zero mod p. So at the level of primes, you are going to get zero for every prime, but you are not going to get the number zero in the orbit. So this is definitely an example of a polynomial, which is not nilpotent, but locally nilpotent at one. And in fact, after uh, like three months of work, I was able to show that this is the only polynomial at one, which is not nilpotent, but locally nilpotent. Okay, and the next two examples are also talking about uh, nilpotent polynomials. So you have the same starting point one, and you can look at this polynomial. So that would be, uh, that would take one to two, uh, it would take two to three, and three would be taken to zero, okay? And in fact, if you give me a natural number, it doesn't matter how high it is, we can always construct a polynomial which is going to have, which, which is going to start at some point and is going to have exactly that index. So that is going to be X minus one. So you can, you can give me any, any R that you want, and then you construct this one, this polynomial X minus one, and then R would go, go to R minus one, R minus one would go to R minus two and so on and so forth. And finally, when you look at the Rth step or the Rth iteration, that is going to go to zero. And of course, zero cannot come before that. So it, it will have exact index R. Okay. Any questions at this point? All right. <clears throat> I mean, uh, the thing is I didn't include a proof or I should rather say I couldn't include the proof because the proofs are quite long and it, it takes uh, you know, a lot of time to verify uh, the details. So uh, the only things I could include was a sketch of one of the proofs and uh, one whole proof, which is kind of short, but I think that it is very interesting because all the things that we needed to do that particular proof is elementary number theory, nothing else. But there are some dense machineries involved in there, uh, not in my proofs, but the results that we have used to have this proof. So th there are uh, five things that I've used here throughout the paper uh, in order to prove stuff. So the first of uh, that is going to, is that, so that is for fact one. What is fact one saying is, is saying that it is enough to consider the starting points, which are natural numbers and uh, zero. So all the non-negative uh, integers. So if we have enough information about the local nilpotentness or nilpotentness of a polynomial at the non-negative integers, then we should be able to get the information at, 
at minus r. So what, what's happening on, for the negative integers? And this is exactly how. So if let's say u is a polynomial of degree d, then v of x, we can define v of x to be minus u of minus x. So if we do that, then we can see that v of minus x is going to be minus of u of x. And by induction, one can see that the nth iteration of u at minus r is equals to minus of nth iteration of u at r. So if this is zero, then this is zero. And if a prime divides this, then a prime should also divide this. So if we can get enough information about all the non-negative integers, then we should be able to get the information about the negative integers. So that, that is what we did. This observation was by uh, Professor Borisov, and he said that it, it, is, it is enough to consider all the uh, non-negative integers as a starting point. Okay, uh, the next uh, tool would be a lemma, which I devised, and that is an outcome of a theorem by Rene Skouf and uh, one other person. Unfortunately, I, I cannot uh, uh, pronounce it correctly, so I'm not going to. Uh, so uh, they published a paper in 1997 in uh, Journal of Number Theory. And this is a very interesting result, actually. It, it, this theorem is not the only theorem there. There is another theorem, which is an elliptic analog, uh, elliptic curve analog of this particular result. And uh, it is not really a, a very big paper, but it, uh, it involves a lot of very serious mathematics in algebraic number theory. So what they used here to prove this, let me just uh, state what the theorem is, then I will tell you maybe a few words on that. So they are starting with the number field K and they're uh, picking up X and Y uh, such that none of those uh, X and Y are zero. And also they're assuming that for almost all the prime ideals P of OK, so almost all means uh, uh, all prime ideals except for finitely many uh, of OK, we, we have this. So in other words, uh, if, um, if Xn is congruent to one modulo P, that would imply that a Y to the N is going to be congruent to one modulo P. If that is the case, then Y is going to be a power of X. So at, at the level of prime ideals, if you have this containment, then uh, X is, uh, y, y is literally a power of X. This takes quite some work. And what they used is, at least what I understand so far is, uh, they used uh, Kumar's theory and the Chibotari F's density theory. And yeah, it, it, is, it is, uh, very nice. The proof is uh, quite nice. And uh, there are some things that I still don't understand, but it, it is worth reading. I have included that in the uh, references. So when I go to that page, I will point out this particular paper. And as a consequence of that, we get this lemma. Again, this is not obvious how one can use this to get that, but I mean, uh, if, if you're interested, I can show you a proof of that. It is not, uh, it's a small proof. So it would, if it wouldn't take too much time. So if you have enough time after I'm done with the talk, I can, show you the proof. So the lemma is like this. If you pick three non-zero integers in such a way that neither uh, beta over gamma or gamma over beta is a non-negative power of alpha, then this set difference, so all the primes p, which, are, which doesn't divide this thing for any, for any n, that set is going to be an infinite set. Okay, I, and uh, I'm pretty sure, although I, I don't need it, but I'm pretty sure that this set is a set of positive density, not just infinite set. Okay, so the next one would be reduction of polynomials. So uh, let, let, me, uh, let me see a few words before I get to that. So you see, uh, so the idea of this particular concept, this strategy, reduction of polynomials, is that uh, how far can we push our knowledge of local real polynomials at one? So 
um, if we have enough information about one, can we really generalize this to arbitrary Rs? It turns out that with some uh, assumptions, it can be done. So this is what it is trying to describe. So you start with some natural number n. By the way, uh, in here, I said that if we have information about R, we should be able to uh, get minus R. So that means the zero case has to be treated separately. So uh, in, in here, we are not really considering the zero case when R is equal to zero. So I, I, have, I described a theorem here, uh, like in the next page, I think, where the zero case is, has been uh, considered and solved. So you have a starting point R, which is a natural number, and you have a polynomial U in such a way that the constant term of the polynomial is divisible by R. Okay, so you now consider this polynomial, uh, instead of U, you consider the polynomial U of Rx. So U of Rx, that is a polynomial, and the constant term, whatever that is, is divisible by R. So that means if you divide uh, u, u of Rx by R, that is still going to be a polynomial over C. Okay, and that polynomial, we are calling it V. And uh, so that means R, so in other words, R Vx is going to be equal to U of Rx. So by induction, one can see that R times Vn, uh, uh, n iteration of V at one is the uh, n iteration of U at R for every n unit. Okay, so if uh, prime divides this, then that would mean it divides this, the, the whole thing, I mean. So, uh, yes, and only, and there are only finitely many primes, P, which are uh, going to divide R. So for uh, all the rest of the primes, it is going to divide this one. So if we have enough information about weakly locally nil potent polynomials at one outside some finite set A, we should be able to get enough information to uh, uh, unravel the, or, or yeah, unravel the list of all the polynomials which are going to be locally nil potent at R. So that, that, is the, that is what this reduction of polynomials is uh, trying to um, understand or trying to use. Okay, so in other words, uh, u of x is local nilpotent at r, if and only v of x is local nilpotent at one outside uh, the set, which uh, well, where you only consider primes, which are diverse r. Okay, so and then, and this is why it is called reduction because uh, instead of considering the local nilpotent polynomials at r, we are considering weakly local nilpotent polynomials at one. And uh, so of course, the, this, this thing, we, we have to be careful about that. Uh, but if this is satisfied, then we, we have a sufficient knowledge once we get enough information about weakly local nilpotent polynomials at one. So next thing is, is a very hard fact. It, it, it is a, a, a huge paper and uh, it was published sometime in 2013, I think, by uh, Professor Tom Tucker of Rochester and Professor Tom Scanlon from Berkeley. Uh, the paper is quite long and it's extremely technical. And this hard fact that uh, you uh, that we have here is uh, like a very, very, very particular case of a theorem in the paper. So what it is saying is this, that you can start with any number field that you want, any number, your favorite number field, let's say, and uh, your uh, R you choose for to be any uh, algebraic integer. And then phi is a rational map of degree at least two. All right, also suppose that R is not a pre-periodic point of phi. So pre-periodic points are those points uh, when you get the set of orbits to be finite, and then you have the, uh, the and, and then you have the idea of periodic point where you come back to the starting point. So that, that is the idea of a periodic point. A pre-periodic point is when you have the 
when you have the orbit finite. So we are not considering uh, that particular R. So uh, if, if that is the case, then uh, one can find some M and a positive density of primes. Uh, okay, I, I think I mentioned density before, but here when I say density, I mean um, natural density. And of course, if natural density exists, then all the other densities that people generally see, generally talk about, they all exist and are equal. So yeah, and in this case, uh, what they're using is tributary of density theorem, and that is really uh, uh, is a natural density. So uh, there we can always find an M and we can always find a positive density of primes, P prime, let's say, in OK, such that, uh, so for every small m larger than capital M, you cannot get zero modulo all the primes, which appears in P prime. Okay, so what does that say for us? So this condition, what does that mean in our case? What it means is that, so when I say this condition, I mean R is not pre-periodic a point of phi. So if let's say we want to look at those polynomials U at R, which are not nilpotent, but locally nilpotent, then obviously R cannot give you a, a p-periodic point, or rather R, is, R cannot be a p-periodic point, right? So it, it, is, it is quite clear what, what we want here. So in particular, uh, let me rephrase what I said. In particular, what I mean is that if U is, in, is, is a polynomial such that degree of U is greater than or equals to two, then saying that U is locally the important is the same thing as saying that U is the important at R. So if you want to find the polynomials, which are locally nilpotent at, at, at any starting point, but not nilpotent, you are going to get those polynomials in the linear case. So the linear case will, con will, will contain all of those polynomials. We don't have to go higher than that. That is what this fact means. So uh, this is a very recent finding of, uh, of uh, mine. Well, I mean, it is not really my finding, but uh, Professor Tucker pointed this out to me because initially uh, this was a conjecture in my paper, but now that I found it, it, it was uh, uh, like 10, uh, 10 days back maybe. So this is a very recent thing that we found. And it turns out that we had two conjectures in the paper and this fact answers both those conjectures. So it's a very beautiful results, but it's too technical. I mean, if you want, I can share the link with you of the paper and you can go to theorem five of that paper and you will see that all of those things that appears there, it's, uh, it probably wouldn't make sense like how I'm get, getting this fact out of that particular theorem. But we want to spend a few, like 10, 15 minutes on, to understand what's going on and what they're trying to say, it is, it, is going to, it is going to make sense to you that this indeed, uh, one can really get something like that if, if uh, one is careful. Okay, so, uh, so these are the four tools that uh, uh, we have used in order to prove all of the results that appears in the paper. And um, so this is not really something uh, very complicated. It's, it's, it's quite straightforward that when you have the linear case, you can actually get a very nice iteration formula, but that is not possible for higher degree polynomials because you see, if you start with a degree D polynomial, then the nth iteration of that particular polynomial is going to have a degree D to the N. And it's, uh, I don't think it's even possible to get a general formula like that. It's, it's quite complicated. Okay. For some very, very special families of polynomials, you can get a formula. Simple example is X to the D. Obviously you can iterate that and get an explicit formula very easily. Right, right. You're right. But if you, Another example is Chebyshev polynomials, okay, which can also be iterated very easily if you think about it. But uh, those those families are pretty much it. 
other than that, it, I mean, you can change variables and get uh, similar families, but basically that's it for iteration, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I've, I actually looked it up, like try to find if it is possible even to get a general formula for DDD, but yes, you were right. Uh, I, I don't think I found the, I found any difference of JVJ polynomial, but uh, the linear polynomial uh, and the uh, x, x to the d polynomial, that is clear. But uh, yeah, Chebyshev polynomials, think about them in terms of trigonometric and inverse trigonometric functions, and you'll see why you can iterate them very easily. Okay, all right, I'll think about it. Thank you. So, and, and the uh, x to the d, this kind of polynomials, that is not very interesting to us because if, if you plug in some r, right, and, and you take iterations of that, the only primes that is going to make it zero is going to be exactly those primes which divides r. So unless your starting point is zero, it is not really interesting at all. And, and in fact, that is the reason that I'm skipping all the constant polynomials because it's just not really any, very fascinating. But for only finitely many primes, you are going to get zero. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, this is the this is the iteration formula for linear polynomials. And I mean, it's, it's uh, very easy to check it. It's quite straightforward. Okay, and, and uh, whenever, I don't think I mentioned it here, but uh, in the paper, I have mentioned it quite a few uh, times that they, we will call this the linear iteration formula. Well, there is only one, so anyway. Uh, so let's move on to the next results, uh, next result. So that is, uh, or I should say next section. This section contains five results, which I have picked from the paper. And uh, so the first one is talking about what, what I explained in uh, example C, I think. So X plus one is the only locally nilpotent polynomial, which is not nilpotent at one. So this theorem is describing the list. So this is a classification theorem of all the, where it classifies all the polynomials, which are local nil point at one. One, two, and three, this being all the families where you can get either index one. So one is index one, two is index two, and three is index three. And you are not going to get index four if your starting point is one. And I can give you a sketch of the proof Although I'm going to say it very casually, but it takes quite some time to check all of these details uh, and it's uh, non-trivial to say the least. So uh, if you start with some mu, which is in the in this set, uh, that um, by the way, uh, let me remind you what this means. It means local nilpotent at one. A fee just means that we are not excluding any primes. So we can analyze this u in three cases. So case one would be where u one minus one is a non-unit. So if u one minus one is a non-unit, then we can always find a prime p that would divide u one minus one. Like let's say, let's call it the, uh, call the prime p. So in other words, u of one is congruent to one modulo that particular prime p. So if you look at the set, uh, uh, the orbit of uh, u at one, then modulo that prime p, you are going to get only u of one. So of course you cannot get zero for that particular prime. Okay, so that means you cannot be, uh, if, if u has to be local and important that uh, you, you, you cannot, uh, you, you must expect u one minus one to be a unit. Okay, so what, what are the other two cases? Obviously then when oh, this guy's a unit. So let's say the uh, two describes when u1 minus one is minus one. So that means u1 is equals to zero. So that means one is a root of u. So which means you are looking at these guys, one in the list. Okay, and uh, three would be when u1 is equals to two. So in other words, u1 minus one is uh, one. So that means u1 is two. So if u1 is two, after 
uh, a lot of time, one can show that if v1 is two, then you have exactly two possibilities. Either u2 is zero or u2 is three. So if u2 is zero, then you have the second family in the list. And, and what are we doing to construct the second family? What we're using here is u1 is two and u2 is zero. And you can see that this one, uh, it, it's exactly like that. And then p times, you know, when one is a root and two is a root, both of those, uh, both of the, both of these numbers are roots. And then if u2 is not equal to zero, then u2 must be three. All right. So now we look at that case, u2 is three. Again, with some work, one can show that u3 is either zero or u3 is equal to four. If u of three is equal to zero, then you get this one, the third family in this list. And you, if u3 is not equal to zero, then u3 must be equal to four. Okay. But he, he, here's, here's where you uh, stop getting uh, different branches. If, uh, so in other words, what I mean by that is if u3 is four, then u4 must be equal to five and u5 must be equal to six and so on. So in other words, if u is local in important at one and u of one is two, u of two is three and u of three is four, then u of n is actually n plus one. That's what I'm saying. So uh, you can use induction to show that u of n is equal to n plus one. And that took quite some time for me to actually show that because there are too many details to consider. And we also have used uh, the well-orderedness of z, which is not a natural thing to extend when you look at arbitrary number fields. But it is doable, it is definitely doable. And, uh, and, and of course, if, if you have u of n to be equal to n plus one, then the only polynomial that makes sense is u of x is equal to x plus one. Okay, uh, right. And if we know uh, the local important polynomials at one, as I, as I mentioned uh, in fact one, that we should be able to get all the local important polynomials at minus one. So what we do is we replace the u of x this by minus u of minus x. So um, I, I can show you the list here. So by, from fact one and theorem one, it follows that uh, the, these are all the local and important polynomials uh, at one. So the first one will uh, is, represents uh, nil point polynomials of index one. This family represents nil point polynomials of index two. And this family represents nil point polynomials of index three. And then this one is a single polynomial, which is locally nilpotent, but not nilpotent at minus one. And, th and that means that uh, th this is the only one, this is the only one which is like that, which is locally nilpotent, but not important at one. So moving on, you have, uh, we have theorem two and theorem three. So, uh, recall that from the very hard fact, I said that um, that if R or, or, or if your starting uh, polynomial has degree greater than or equal to two, then uh, it being a locally nilpotent polynomial at R is the same thing as saying that it is nilpotent at R. So that is why uh, we we can consider uh, two things. So only the linear case where you get both the both local nilpotent and nilpotent polynomials and higher degree case where you get only nilpotent polynomials and this this is it this is the list really for local nilpotent polynomials of uh, degree 1 and then theorem 3 describes the only nilpotent polynomials possible when you start at zero and it turns out that the indices of these polynomials must be either one or two. So you cannot go higher than two when your starting point is zero. When I say higher than two, I mean the index higher than two. Okay, so I've included the proof here. 
that proof is uh, not very difficult, so I would like to share that with you. Uh, difficult in the sense that uh, it's, it's uh, very straightforward. The only thing we have used is elementary number theory. <clears throat> so suppose that U is a nilpotent polynomial at zero of index M. If U zero is zero, then index is one, and then UX must look like this for some non-zero P. P of X, I mean. Uh, okay. So we can consider we, we should uh, we should consider the case when u of zero is not equals to zero. So in other words, your index is greater than or equals to m. All right. Now we consider uh, this sequence of numbers. So u sub zero is is going to mean u of zero, and u sub n is going to mean the difference of the n plus one iteration of u at zero and the nth iteration of u at zero. Okay, one thing we have used here is this, that for polynomials, one variable polynomials over Z, um, the difference of the input is always going to divide the difference of the output. Oh, wait, Teresa, so, Teresa? Sorry? I'm nothing. So um, the difference of the input is going to divide the difference of the output. See, so what I mean by that is, if you have two different numbers, A and B, then a minus b is always going to uh, divide u of b minus u of a. So for polynomials, this is always going to be true. For polynomials over z, in one variable is always going to be true. So that is what uh, that is what we used. So using using that particular idea, one can show that you have this uh, divisions like chain uh, that appears in chain. U of zero is going to divide u of one u of one is going to divide u of two and so on up to u of m. And then using the idea that m is the nil potency index of u at zero, they are actually equal. u of u sub m is actually equals to u sub zero. So your starting point is u and you're, you're ending at zero with the successive divisions. So that means that all of these things here are going to be the same in magnitude whenever n is between zero and m. So u of n is going to be plus of minus u of zero whenever you vary n from zero to m. So this is one observation. Another observation is you add up all the numbers, u sub zero up to u sub m minus one. This actually makes sense because m is greater than or equal to one. So that is, uh, uh, well, it is like a you know telescopic series sort of thing. Uh, all the terms will cancel out except for this one, but m is the nil potency index of u at zero, so that means this is equals to zero. So you have all of these numbers which are the same in magnitude, and they add up to zero. So that means uh, the number zero up to m minus one. So the, uh, this is a, an even. Uh, yes, so uh, that means M is even, right? Because there are M, M numbers here. So that means M must be even and exactly half of these numbers are positive and the other half is negative. So you can find two successive numbers, let's say UK and uh, UK minus one, where one of them is negative and another one is positive. So this is what I mean. You can always select a K from this list of numbers such that uk minus one is exactly going to be equals to minus of uk. And you, using the definitions of u sub k minus one and u sub k, you can see that it means that uh, the k plus one iteration of u at zero is going to be the k minus iteration of u at zero. So it, it, is, it is like a period two, so to speak, of iterations. So that, that, that's what I'm saying here. Uh, the n plus two th iteration of u at zero is going to be the nth iteration of u at zero whenever n lies between k minus one and m. So in particular, one can see that the second iteration of u at zero is exactly equals to zero using this. And since u of zero is not equals to zero, that would imply that m is equals to two and u of x is exactly of this form where you are choosing alpha to be some non-zero integer and you're choosing P to be a polynomial over Z such that 
P of zero is equals to minus one. So an example of that would be U of X equals to X minus one squared. So when you plug in zero, you, you get one squared and when you plug in one, you get zero. All right, the, uh, these are the final two results. Uh, and this, uh, and by, okay, so let me just pull it up. Okay, so theorem four, as, uh, as we have observed in the reduction of polynomial case, that if we understand all the locally nilpotent polynomials at one outside some, uh, sorry, weakly locally nilpotent polynomials at one, outside some finite set A, then we should be able to get the information about the local nilpotent polynomials at R. And so I, I was able to show that this is the entire list of all the weakly local nilpotent polynomials at one of degree one, because the degree one is, is the only case when, when you can get uh, non-nilpotent non and local nilpotent polynomials. So that is what we are considering here in theorem four. And using that, we were able to get theorem five, where you consider arbitrary R, and this is the list of all the local nilpotent polynomials at R, of uh, 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 sorry, local nilpotent polynomials at R, which are not nilpotent, and these are everything. This is the list. So all of this uh, follows this theorem that you have seen is is uh, really a classification theorem of all the polynomials that is possible. And uh, we are only interested in the linear case because of the very hard fact that the, the linear case is the only thing that is worth looking when you're not looking for nilpotent polynomials. Okay, and then we have the references. So, uh, yes, I, I would like to point out now the ones that I uh, uh, I mentioned. So did the, uh, so the lemma one in the tools section is from this paper five, and if I recall correctly, it is theorem one of this paper, and the very hard result is from paper seven, and that is theorem five of the paper. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that is all I wanted to talk about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there questions for our speakers? Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see. Uh, Saya, can you close your screen share? Yes, of course. Excellent. Uh, Questions, comments? I should say. This is Symphony of Spring Symphony, Orchestra <laughs> Revolutionary Romantique, uh -huh. did by John Gardner. Someone has a radio or something going in the background. Uh, oh, it's sorry. In honor of Andre Sakharov. Uh, so, this is our last uh, weekly seminar for the semester since many of us are moving into final exam time. And um, I will remind uh, you uh, that uh, there are two very uh, relevant conferences coming up in uh, two weeks. The uh, integers uh, conference is taking place at uh, the University of Georgia in Athens. And the week after that, uh, the 23rd to the 26th, um, uh, with my apologies for the overlap with uh, Shavuot, uh, the uh, 21st annual CANT conference is going on. Uh, Tuesday is only on Zoom. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are in person and on Zoom. And whether the talk is in person or on Zoom, everything will be live on Zoom. And uh, to the extent that I remember to click re uh, record, of course, and um, archive somewhere on uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, since, um, yes, it's a strange thing, this YouTube. Uh, 
everything is there. Um, and uh, if you couple with YouTube with things like um, the MIT program to put um, uh, almost all of their courses in one form or another online for free, which is an absolutely uh, miraculous thing. In some of the courses, they have, uh, in fact, videos of all of the lectures uh, for the semester, as well as all of the reading materials. It's a um, fantastic resource, uh, uh, no matter how, uh, so long as you have internet access, no matter where you are in the world, you can uh, learn an infinite amount. So uh, uh, after MIT did this, uh, other universities started to do it, but some of them are behind paywalls. But the MIT program has always been 100% free. It's very good. Um, let's see, Jeff, I promised I would show you animal eyes, which I will do in a minute. Uh, any questions, comments, remarks? Uh, Anyone has to make? Very nice results. Very nice, there yes. There is this famous conjecture of cats on no potent P curvature. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll be back in one minute. Um, whatever. Oops. Worth checking how it. Uh, yes, I, I will. Thank you. Not solved. Cat's conjecture is not solved. So when you say cats, you mean Nick cats, right? Excuse me? Uh, so when you, when you say cats, you mean Nick cats, right? Professor Nick cats? Nick cats, many years ago. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's no potent P curvature, and so it's attached to. I think okay. if you uh, start Googling that word term and so on, you'll get to it in short order. I don't know quite how it fits uh, with the framework you're doing. And I, okay. So is there a preprint version of this work? Is it in progress? Uh, yes, it is in archive right now. But uh, when I uploaded that preprint, I didn't have that very hard fact. Now I would like to use that very hard fact in, in order to yeah, you well, know, clean up rewrite such your preprint. Reprint yes. put up a version two. Yeah. Yes, I will. I will definitely. I definitely will. And I would like to do that uh, by the end of this month, if possible. And I would like to send it to. Uh, so I, I have been talking with my advisor, and he 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 said that it's it's going to be a good idea if I send it to the Journal of Integer Sequences. Um. Oh. Yes. So the the paper was in, influenced by one of his papers, and that paper was published from Journal of Integer Sequences. Well, OK. If I have any comment, I'll send it. OK, thank you, sir. I mean, can you see that, Jeff? No. Oh. I will in a second. I had to put it up again. Who wrote it? Uh, it's, it's Animal Eyes. It's written by Michael Land and Dan Eric Nielsen, N-I-L-S-S-O-N, -S -S published by Oxford University Press. What is the first page? Michael what? L-A-N-D. Michael L Land, L-A-N-D. L-I-N-D? No, Land. Like... L A N D. And the other one was who was the author? Yeah, let me, uh, let me just put it in the chat. That's easier. No, no. I mean, I, when you put it on the screen, the and you bent the thing slightly, my my very bad uh, Zoom wouldn't let me read the authors' names. Okay, got it. Animal eyes. Animal eyes, yes. Um, Apparently, trilobites had fantastic eyes. 
many of them I got like a, man, a whole bunch of sensors that were all combined later on the, the eyes are made of agate or something so they crystallize and they survive on the uh trilobite bodies animal eyes provides a comprehensive account of all known types of eye in the animal kingdom outlining their structure and function with an emphasis on the nature of the optical systems and the physical principles involved in image formation. A Great. universal theme throughout the book is the evolution and taxonomic distribution of each type of eye and the roles of different eye types in the behavior and ecology of the animals that possess them. Uh, okay, so I, check the index for, for trilobites now. Trilobites, anomalous eyes, page 189. Okay, so the trilobites are covered. Great. Yes. I think the recording is still on. Hmm? I think the recording is still on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 